Welcome to the Urban Waters Learning Network's Equity and Community Engagement in Watershed Conservation Workshop. I'm Daryl Haddock, and my collaborator is Jennifer Arnold, and we're going to be presenting on equity and community engagement as part of River Rally. We're going to give you a short snippet of what that session entails. Here we go. Um, so we really like to emphasize that equity is both an outcome and a process. As an outcome, everyone has what they need to thrive and race and socioeconomic status do not determine your status. But you can't simply plan for those outcomes and execute it like a blueprint. The process is really important. That people who are most impacted uh, by structural problems are actively engaged in coming up with the solutions. So these two are integrally intertwined. This is a slide that shows how equity, inequity, equality, inequality, and justice all relate. So you'll notice that we have a tree that's bent and the fruit seems to benefit some, but not all. So when we look at inequality, it seems that there isn't an equal distribution of the fruit or the accessibility to the fruit by the tree. When we work towards equality, we provide structures that get towards access, but don't always have the access outcomes to be equal. Equity is where we create structures that actually enable all parties to get access to the fruit, but justice is where we no longer have to work towards manipulating the structure. That we're actually structurally fixing the system rather than just uh, providing supports that um, accommodate for those differences. That's where we really want to head, but often we're staying focused on that equity piece um, with the long-term goal of the justice. Focus. So why I focus on race? Race is the strongest predictor of access to water infrastructure. And we have been having numerous conversations at River Rally for years, really trying to tease out this idea of is race actually a part of equitable water distribution and water quality improvements. But without an intentional focus on anti-racism, reducing these inequities, we see that the basis of income, disability status, often intensify racial disparity. And so race is one of the most persistent um, causes of inequities and one of the hardest to talk about. So how does race and economic status relate? We oftentimes think that economic status, especially in the United States, is kind of the, the one variable that everything tends to fall under. But we also know that race is intrinsically intertwined with economic status. Certainly there are poor people across the board, but oftentimes based on your racial makeup, poverty is exacerbated. And so we wanted to touch base on a few definitions. So we have this common voc vocabulary from which to have the conversation. Um, and racism is a system of power that benefits white people to the detriment of people of color. So it's not simply saying something hurtful to somebody because of their race, but it's that idea that who says it and their power within society can amplify or create a system um, that that benefits one group, white people, to the detriment of people of color. So it's that prejudice combined with that power. And some people say, well, I may not feel like I have power, but the idea is that as a white person in this country, because of the, the way the country was founded and policies and practices over time, that just the color of your skin as being white, you do have certain benefits and privileges. Um, the benefit of the doubt or, um, the chance to go to college because of um, priority admissions for alumni, things like that, um, that 
you do have those benefits. Um, and this is not to say that black people or other people of color don't have benefits, but this is to say that structurally or institutionally, collectively, these benefits tend to benefit whites over people of color. Yeah, so it's a complex system. Each person is has their own life history and their own um, perspective on this. And yet when we take a step back and look at all of society, there are clear patterns and clear systems that do provide um, those benefits to some groups over others. And so this is, oh wait, I'm sorry. Institutionalized racism specifically refers to the structures, the policies and practices that disproportionately benefit white people to the detriment of people of color. So using the um, Gardner's Tale by Dr. Kamara Jones, the idea is that you can have uh, pink flowers and red flowers, you start with seeds and they both have the potential to thrive and make these beautiful plants and flowers. But if you're always planting the pink flowers in rocky soil that is really um, uh, doesn't have that organic matter and isn't going to yield a good plant, and you're always planting the red flowers in these rich, lush soils, then you're going to start to see the plants um, take on those characteristics of red flowers being vibrant and the pink flowers um, straggling along. But, but in this situation, that is due to those um, conditions that are uh, assigned to those different types of flowers. And people start to internalize those stereotypes about the way pink flowers grow or the way red flowers grow. When really, if you had a system whereby you enrich the soils and they both, both types of uh, seeds were growing in this rich soil, you would see both being able to thrive. And that's really what we're getting at when we talk about undoing institutionalized racism. So in the same way, structural racism refers to a system which public policy, institutional practice, cultural representations, and these other norms work in a fashion that often reinforce the ways that we see each other in ourselves. And this can be hard to untangle or explain. And especially for, for white folks, it can be really hard for us to see this because we might be running on the track where things seem uh, like they're built for us and we know what the hurdles are, but we can train and, and prepare for them. But it can be much harder for groups who are facing that structural racism um, to, to make that same race course. And oftentimes when you take those people of color and put them on that more advantage course, they also can fail to see the structures that are in place for others, even in their own race. And so we wanted to highlight this example um, and Catherine Coleman Flowers has just done such an amazing job at profiling this particular issue of the lack of investment in wastewater treatment um, particularly in her home area of um, rural Alabama outside of Montgomery. Um, and the idea that um, this affects poor people, but mostly people of color in this area are Black um, Americans, and that um, the government expects that in these rural areas that people should have the, their funds to install their own septic systems. And yet when they don't, they do the best they can, which is often piping sewage into um, areas with high water tables um, or areas that cannot um, handle uh, the sewage. So you get raw sewage on the surface of people's yards and um, contaminating uh, clean water. And um, she found out that the, um, the state was um, getting complaints and issuing permits and people would actually have to go to court and uh, be forced to pay penalties or even go to jail, but they literally didn't have the maybe 20 or $30,000 to install these systems. And so as a society, what are, what are we doing? Structurally, we're making it impossible for these folks um, to live and thrive in these areas. And oftentimes these are systems that are part of your taxpayer base, right? There's, there's supposed to be municipal systems that are oftentimes 
envisioned to be devoid of barriers, right? Everybody is supposed to have the same accesses. But to the example that we showed in terms of the race course, it's obvious that you know these communities that were low income, largely of color, had structural barriers that did not allow them to have the same outcomes to be able to manage the waste that were coming from you know their own homes. And so we wanted to touch again, we've mentioned this idea of white privilege, the social societal advantage that comes with fitting into the norm of white culture in America that makes life smoother and is automatically granted to white people, irrespective of wealth, gender, or other factors. Um, this has been, uh, this term has been more visible, especially in the last few years, in the last year. But we wanted to take a closer look also at this concept of a dominant white frame. And that's the idea that the view of how things work or should work in the US is often based on white dominant culture. Um, and we hear it um, a lot in the water world of how can we get more people of color in our workforce or on our board. Um, and it's that idea that the norm or the assumed uh, kind of basis from which we're working is based on this um, we as the white folks. Um, and often that's not explicitly known or understood. And unless we really unpack that, we're not going to be able to get at these structural issues. So when we look at this dominant white frame, how it plays out, perhaps in a, a retail environment, um, we can see that, you know, this notion of American retail or, or westernized retail, you know, it's something that we're all very, very familiar with. But there are certainly other ways that, you know, other communities address and feel comfortable in terms of commerce. And so here is an Asian American market, for example. And between the two examples, there's a whole different look and feel that for some, this might seem unorganized or um, a little cluttered or perhaps make people feel uncomfortable because you have products and goods that aren't packaged that are kind of out and about uh, and in the, in the areas. And so it's, it's an understanding that there are many, many ways that communities may look at the same kinds of infrastructure. Um, but the one that we most often see here in the United States is that dominant white framing of, of society. And as white people, I'm going to go back to this one, we may feel like, well, everybody feels comfortable in this space. Um, but really the idea that those unspoken norms or the way products are set up or the products that are offered are often very much directed and marketed to white folks or that um, middle or upper class. And of course, folks of color can still enjoy these places, but some products maybe like hair products or certain food products, maybe they don't. And maybe they have to learn how to, you know, the unspoken rules of how things are organized. Um, whereas in, you know, for white folks or folks who are not from that um, Asian American background, um, this may feel really uncomfortable. Um, and so that contrast, and we use the grocery store because it's a very familiar example to folks, to just help to illuminate that there are probably other spaces where you feel comfortable that other people may not. And so we're gonna transition to the uh, kind of example of a planning meeting that might be common for folks working in water issues. So oftentimes we may see this as the typical kind of project facilitation um, the typical engagement process where we've invited community members to come in and we want to share on a project and solicit feedback. And folks here, you can tell they're engaged, they're excited, they're grabbing pens and markers. And so we might say this is an excellent example of a meeting that's very engaging. And if other folks aren't here, it's because they're not interested or they don't want to come. And so we're going to challenge you to take a different way of thinking about community engagement, um, that who is engaged, who, who comes to your space and how they engage might have a lot to do with that framing or those kind of unspoken rules of what's expected and, and um, which audiences you're speaking to. And to contrast that, this is an example of some, a series of meetings and planning effort that's really based on this multicultural and anti-racist frame that's specifically about 
um, being inclusive of people with different ways of knowing and interacting and engaging with the community and really lifting that up and celebrating that in ways that people then open up, they attend, they engage in ways that um, may not be possible in a, in a more traditional watershed planning meeting like the last photo. And, and a lot of times it's very hard to distinguish the subtleties because of that framing. So this may look like, well, why are folks still sitting in their seats? Or why it perhaps might there be this call and response um, to conversations and referencing when somebody may be speaking over or shortly after the presenter speaks. Um, and so we have to recognize that culturally, cultures may express themselves very differently from the kinds of framing that we're often used to imagining and seeing. And this could feel much more culturally responsive, culturally relevant to communities of color, to indigenous communities, because of the way that they interact with each other. And so this is really designed just to be a teaser for ways to start thinking, reimagining what community engagement could look like and applying some of these core concepts about equity and race to your work. And we really do emphasize it to all of us working together to move this forward. Thank you so much for taking this journey with us and we look forward to seeing you in our session. Thank you.